Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. Do you remember your calling to your spiritual path? That voice, that guidance you received, an inclination, an intuition that led you to want to know God more deeply, experience the divinity you are more fully, or just to find out more about spirituality. For many of us, we hear an inner calling to a deeper life in God. Uh, we know we can live with more freedom, more peace, and more love, but where do we begin? Where do we begin? So this chapter is all about that beginning and the path, taking the path and seeing the way, so seeing the way and taking the path. And this is chapter four in Living Buddha, Living Christ by Thich Nhat Hanh, the series that we have been doing here. And so we're moving into more of an understanding of the way that is laid out already for us, that there is already a way. We don't have to figure it out or invent it. It's already uh, been available to us through the teachings of Jesus Christ and the Buddha, and they exist as living teachings. Yes, these were beings, people who lived a human life in a certain time and place. Their teachings are living teachings, and they give us a path and show us a way that we can follow to unfold what is already enfolded in us, the divinity that is enfolded within us, to express it and experience it as we serve the world. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus tells the parable of the mustard seed, and he describes the kingdom of God to be like a tiny mustard seed. Have you ever held a mustard seed? They're just so tiny, so very, very small. And it's interesting that he takes something that we think of as a kingdom, right? So, you know, unlimited to say, it's like a tiny mustard seed. Why? Why? Because it begins in us like that seed. And he says, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that birds come and perch in its branches. So that is the understanding of the kingdom of God that is within us, within all of us, without a doubt, no matter who, everyone has it. And it begins as a seed. And we don't have to die to experience it. Perhaps you thought of the kingdom of God like, well, I'll get there, and after all this, we don't have to die to experience it. It's already here. And we need to plant the seed in moist soil in our lives. You ever plant seeds? Do anyone do any gardening? Yeah. So you know if you plant your seed in dry soil, or soil that's all kind of bunched up and rocky, nothing's going to happen there. The, the roots won't have anywhere to go. The seed won't be able to, to absorb the water to, to grow and take root and sprout up. We need moist soil. So what is moist soil? Think about in your life, what is that moist soil? That, that desire in your heart to know God more, the desire for peace, to have an open heart, right? To be open to the teachings and to other people, to give love. Dry soil is like when we get caught up in sense consciousness and all the busyness of life, of the physical life, and we lose sight of the spiritual. We can be trying to plant seeds in, in dry soil where we're not tending to them, 
gardening to them, giving them the water, the sun, all that they need. Now, young plants are so tender. Once that, that small seed starts growing, you know that you need to make sure that if there's going to be some rough weather, that you take the plant in or you cover it and you take care of it because it could just blow over or an animal could come easily eat it. But you know that once that plant grows and you can take it out of its pot and put it into the ground and it can really take root and grow strong, that that plant doesn't need as much babying and, and tending. And that's how the spiritual life is, that at first, it's something that you're doing, and you've really got to engage the practice and tend to it. And as you do it more and more and more, it becomes who you are rather than something that you're doing. And it's more incorporated, right? It's not like, oh, I, I've got to remember. It's, it's so much a part of who you are and, and how you live and how you serve. So the kingdom of God is not a place, but a level of consciousness, a level of consciousness. So how do we nurture our consciousness to experience that? One approach that Thich Nhat Hanh encourages us into is to study the master teachers. And the master teachers that we've been focusing on are Jesus Christ and the Buddha. The study of the Buddha's life is called Buddhology. There's a term for it, Buddhology, and it's about the man who was born named Siddhartha Gautama, and he is the man who is later known as Buddha. And he was born in Kapilavastu, which is near the border of India and Nepal. He got married, he had a child, and then he left home. And when he left home, he practiced all different kinds of meditation. He deeply became uh, invested in his practice as a monk, and he became enlightened. And he then became called the Buddha. And the word Buddha was not his name, but it, it's a name that means the enlightened one, just as Christ means the anointed one. It, it's a holy moniker that was given to her, to him as uh, as what he was called as a teacher. And he taught, once he was enlightened, he taught all the way until he died when he was 80 years old. The study of the historical Jesus is called Christology or Christology. Jesus, we, many of us know probably better than the, the Buddha story, that he was born in Bethlehem to Mary and Joseph, who he was the son of a carpenter. And he traveled far from his homeland to, um, and, the, and the Bible doesn't tell us a lot about those, what they call the lost years of Jesus's life when he was traveling and perhaps learning meditation and spiritual practices and, uh, and uh, enriching his life in that way. Um, the scripture says, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And that is a symbol in the scripture to tell us that he was enlightened. He became uh, fully conscious of his Christ, Christhood, right? Fully Christed, full, fully expressing his divinity. And when that happened, he went forward, he became a teacher, and he taught until he was crucified at the age of 33. And as the son of Mary and Joseph, we know that he is the son of a woman and a man, right? He's the son of woman and man. Buddha was also the son of a woman and a man. So what about the living Buddha, the living Christ? So we're talking about people who were born and they died, they lived on this planet a human life. So there is, there are the people who lived and then there is the consciousness that they expressed. The consciousness of Buddha, the consciousness of Christ, is that which transcends time and space that is eternal, that lives on and lives with us, and is uh, symbolized by Jesus' presence here in the pyramid, uh, that, that his consciousness continues to 
um, just, just be ever present and, and also present the same ultimate reality that is present in us. And it's available to us at any time, this consciousness always present. It was never born and it doesn't die because it's not of the relative realm. It is of the spiritual, the absolute realm, right? So this is the consciousness that this title of this book is referring to, the living Buddha, the living Christ that is present and lives within us as that tiny mustard seed that we plant and grow and develop. And it is the energy of the Holy Spirit that is embodied in us. It's another way to look at it. I talked about Holy Spirit a couple of weeks ago. And, um, and this here he mentions again that that Christ consciousness, Buddha consciousness is the energy of the Holy Spirit. When we look deeply into the lives of Buddha and into the life of Jesus, according to Thich Nhat Hanh, we can penetrate the reality of God. He puts it that way. Imagine that, kind of hold on to that image of studying their lives, and through that study, you can penetrate to the reality of God, and that's the purpose of the study. Now, many Christians see Jesus as the only son of God. In unity, we have a different understanding. We see him also as the son of man, that Jesus was fully human and fully divine. And this is the essence of our teaching in unity that is a metaphysical understanding of the Bible, because how else could we be seeing the way and taking the path if that path wasn't accessible to all of us because he was a, a god, a, a divine being, then we would say, well, we could worship him, but it's not attainable. And so in unity, we say, and we understand what the Bible was showing us metaphysically in Jesus' teachings, that this is a path that is accessible to all of us Buddhists, they accept the non-duality. This is called non-duality between the Father and the Son, between the Christ consciousness and the absolute or God or whatever other word that you would use for that, um, the allness, right? The oneness. Now, without God, the Father within him, the Son could never be. Think of that, really, that, that the that there must be both, right? In order for Jesus to express his full divinity, that there was always the presence of God within him and that same true for all of us. His life is his most basic demonstration of this teaching. So while we can study words, he said, really can look over the course of his life and see that demonstration so we can see the divine pattern that is there that's available to us. When the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus as represented by the dove, he manifested the Son of God. And Thich Nhat Hanh says that Jesus then began to express that which is very holy, very deep, and very great. Very holy and very deep and very great that that came forward in him and was seen and known. And let us know that the Holy Spirit is not just for Jesus, that the Holy Spirit is for all of us. Or in unity, we usually just say spirit. We mean the Holy Spirit, the whole spirit of God. When Siddhartha sat under the Bodhi tree, that is where he became enlightened, he became in touch with the highest spirit within himself. And when we do this, we too are a Buddha or a Christ. And perhaps you did so tonight when you are met in our time of meditation and touched into that. We're filled with the Holy Spirit. And Thich Nhat Hanh says that we become very tolerant when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we become very tolerant, very open, very deep, 
and very understanding, very understanding. Imagine bringing that, all those wonderful qualities that are available to us as we tap in, open up, allow the Buddha, the Christ, to be revealed in us as us. Jesus said, I am the door. Isn't that an amazing? I love that mystical phrase, I am the door. There's so much to be felt into that. I am the door. So we're understanding that I am, that he's talking about is the I am consciousness. That I am consciousness, the Christ consciousness within us. The door to the kingdom of God is through the Christ within. The Lord's Prayer says, thy kingdom come. Not that we need to go to the kingdom, but Jesus was saying that really it's the kingdom dawning on us. It's coming to us because it's coming into our awareness, into our consciousness, it being always present. The Buddha, interestingly enough, was also described as a door, a door, as a master teacher, also known as a door. And he is a teacher that shows us the way. And his way that he taught is the path of mindfulness. And that's the path of being fully awake. When we live in a mindful way, when we're mindful of our breathing, of how we walk, of how we eat, of our prayer life, we become fully awake. And in that fully awakened state, fully aware, that is when we experience and fully express the Holy Spirit. The Dharma are the teachings of the Buddha, and they are considered to be living teachings that they are are like a real body, a body of teaching that they have a life of their own. Thich Nhat Hanh says, the door allows us to enter the realm of mindfulness, loving kindness, peace, and joy. And that is the door of the Buddha and the Dharma. The Buddha said that his Dharma body is more important than his physical body when he was alive and teaching, that the Dharma body was more important. And why? Why was this? Because to experience nirvana, right, freedom and and peace, we need to practice the Dharma here and now. And the living Dharma is mindfulness, living in a mindful way. And that's what the Buddha manifested in his daily life. That is what he practiced and how he lived. And the Dharma lives when we too practice mindfulness in our daily lives. I thought this was so beautiful what Thich Nhat Hanh said, that we are all mothers of the Buddha and that we all have a womb that each of us is the womb of the Buddha, whether you're male or you know, female expressing, that we have a womb and that we are all pregnant with the potential of awakening. Just as a pregnant woman knows what, that what she eats and drinks and, and her actions that she takes, her thoughts even affect her baby affect the baby that she's carrying. I was very present to that when I was pregnant and wanting to make um, wise and kind choices for my child, that we care for our baby Buddha when we practice mindfulness, that we're cultivating that consciousness. One day, the, we trust that one day the enlightened one will reveal himself or herself to us in the same way that that happened for the Buddha, and it takes that nurturing and tender care through the mindfulness practice and the Buddhist path. The Buddhists also regard Buddha as a teacher and a brother, but not as a god. And and so that's the same as in unity, how we regard Jesus as a teacher, brother, way shower, but not as a deity himself because he was uh, both human, fully human, and divine. So what are, what is the way that these two teachers expressed? 
It is evident when you look at the lives and the scriptures of Jesus and of the Buddha that as children, they both became aware that there was a lot of suffering in the world, that many, many people, if not most or all people, experience suffering, that life was filled with suffering, and so they made every effort in their lives to reduce the world's suffering. We know Jesus was a healer. He prayed. He laid his hands on people. He, uh, he taught. He fed people. He met with prostitutes and tax collectors and all different types of people to bring healing and teaching and peace. And he recognized that the suffering was both around us and inside us. Jesus is called the master psychologist because of his awareness of the, the human psyche and the, the way that we get so troubled. And so we have to find ways through these paths, right, whatever path you choose or, or both, however you're, you're um, following this, to transform the suffering within ourselves to well-being and to peace, and that can be our regular practice. Buddha became a monk at age 29, and at age 35, he was enlightened. And Jesus also spent time in the mountain and, and in the desert praying and doing spiritual work on himself before he went out and did his ministry. In both traditions, in both Buddhism and Christianity, there are monks and nuns, as we know, in that they, they practice prayer and meditation, mindful walking and silent meals, and many other ways to overcome suffering. And so these practices may seem very simple. And in our regular daily lives, we can say, I don't have time for that. I don't have time to slow down. And the way that Thich Nhat Hanh explains it, he says, it's like being a mother covering her chicks, a mother hen covering her chicks. So imagine this hen covering um, her chicks in her nest, right? That one day insight will be born like a baby chick. So those, um, those eggs will hatch and insight will be born and there'll be a baby chick. And in order for that to happen in us, we need time to reflect and to refresh ourselves. And it may be difficult to find the time, but it's important to do so. The Buddha said, look deeply into the nature of suffering to see the causes of suffering and the way out. So that's the way out, is to look very deeply into it. We typically want to resist it and avoid it and get out of it. And, um, and what he was teaching was to be mindful, to be present, to go deeply into it, and you will see the way out and through. Monks, and, monks do this, of course, and non-monks can do this. We can all do this. We all have the ability to do this. Buddhist scripture says, there is a person whose appearance on earth is for the well-being and happiness of all. Who is that person? For Buddhists, it is the Buddha, and for Christians, it is Jesus. And thanks to many generations of Buddhists and Christians, that the energy of the teachings of Jesus and Buddha have been transferred through the generations to us. Isn't that beautiful? That the, the Dharma, the way that Jesus taught and the, and the teachings of the Buddha passed down through faithful people from generation to generation to this now moment. And there is that continuation of the body of Christ, which is your body, the continuation of the Buddha's body, which is your body. And we help their teachings continue through our bodies, through getting to live in, this, in a physical form to practice. And so Thich Nhat Hanh closes this teaching on um, see, seeing the way and taking the path with this. He says, enjoy breathing. Just enjoy breathing. Like it can be as simple as that. Enjoy breathing and know that because you're alive, everything is possible. 
be just by virtue of you being alive. Everything's possible. Walk on this earth in peace and making happy steps on the planet. I love that. He's so joyful. Making happy steps on the planet. Walk in peace. Every moment is an opportunity for you to manifest the Buddha in you, the Christ in you. So just know that. And through your enjoyment of being alive, you help the living Buddha, the living Christ, to continue for a long, long time. Namaste. You thank you, Jean Marie. This was um, this was lovely. Um, it was a great um, juxtaposition of the Buddha and the Christ, wasn't it? Yeah, that was a really great way to look at it. And um, I don't know if I've heard of Jesus and Buddha b being called the door. You know, I, I know I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus, but. Um, I love that, and I love the juxtaposition of those two things. That was really interesting. And it, it makes perfect sense because they're, as you said, you know, they, they are, um, Jesus is all human and all divine, and the Buddha was the awakened one, so fully human, who fully woke up, fully saw life as it really is and lived in it, you know. So both of them are doorways, Buddha of mindfulness, of the waking up and seeing things as they are, and Jesus of being, inhabiting both and bringing them forth and, and giving us two doors to, <laughs> to operate through. So I was fascinated by that. And um, and um, also in particular because my white stone words were open door. So um, I guess that's, to me, I need to open the door and pay attention to what's going on already. So I took it very personally, so thank you for that tonight. First discovered this book was Oh, I don't know if I discovered unity yet, or I wasn't really, in, you know, kind, maybe I'd gone to church, to a church once or twice, and this book blew me away, because I was raised Catholic, and all the things that they said, and the connection with Buddhism, I was just in awe of the possibilities of, of myself, and of each person, and um, just found this chapter re-illuminated, <clears throat> that same kind of uh, wonder at the possibilities that we all have for expressing even more fully the light and the love that we are. It, it's a bit of fascinating study of the two um, ways of reflecting on deity um, and teachers. I think... Um, I grew up in a traditional Methodist church, and for years, I had to translate. It, you know, it's just like, because I, I was, I mean, I, I, my mother was like the church lady. You know, she was one of the charter members of the church I was raised in. So, I mean, I was like really in that faith. And um, I remember kind of going through a process of, uh, I was all, when I became an adult and I began working for other churches, you know, in different faiths, I remember thinking, this isn't quite the whole story. But there's a, there's a process that I think, um, I, the only reason I'm bothering to share this is because I just presume there are others who have a similar experience. I know there are some lucky people who come to unity without any uh, um, infection. <laughs> Of, of other uh, ways of being sort of proselytized in, into a very specific way of thinking. But for me, there was like a little mini exorcism that had to happen, you know? Like I was so taught the way to do it that to not do that is kind of like, 
really? Oh, it feels so risky, you know? And uh, then once having kind of made that decision for myself and then ste stepping across the threshold of that risk, then books like this and the teaching and introduction to, to unity, it's like, oh, is it like a big drink of, of cool water? It suddenly it was very refreshing and it made sense. No longer was it argumentative that, that there could be an enlightened one and then there could be another representation of God that was wholly divine and wholly human. Um, but I also like what you were saying that uh, about um, the what they're teaching. Not only was it a fascinating study of these two faiths, these two traditions, but it, it was practical, you know, about to end suffering. Uh, and and I, I simplify it for myself just to say, I want to see the Christ light in others, and I want to participate in their lives as if it's being elicited from me that they see the Christ light in me. And I, I, can, I can live into that. I can make it up. Whether they, what, regardless of what they're thinking, I can be that they see the Christ light in me. And it affects my behavior. It, it certainly affects my consciousness, my thoughts. I, that's, that was what I was hearing you say, whether you, <laughs> that's exactly what you said or not. That's a, what I was inspired to hear. Thank you. I think that unity does have, it can sound like some special language when you first come, what is, what is that all about? I hear words that I might have heard in the theology of my upbringing, and, but they're saying it in a totally different way. And it took me years, I think my husband and I, of just kind of coming to service and leaving, coming to service and leaving, till we really felt like, is this our church? Because we like what they're saying, but, I don't know if I fully get it. And it took a while for that theology in me. I think exorcism might be really the perfect word, that there's just some, some of that old devil, Satan stuff that I needed to get out. Evil, sin, salvation, stuff that unity says, well, here's how we see it metaphysically. And it's like, wow, I'm relieved. Relieved, there's a lot. Of yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it, to consider how we were taught about God and taught about um, the universe or, you know, um, you know, I was not, as a child, I wasn't naturally in inquisitive about death or about what happened after death or anything like that, even while I had um, uh, grandparents that passed while I was very young and attended funerals and all that, but in the Catholic Church, um, you know, I really didn't get a chance to get curious, you know. It was just given to me, this is, this is Jesus, this is what he did, see he's up on a cross, <laughs> except in, in the Catholic Church he really was on a cross, and, and the whole thing, you know, it was just like, oh, well, that's interesting. Well, you know, they're answering questions I didn't have, yeah. and, um, and I hadn't asked, and so I was just like, you know, like you said, falling in line with it. And I think at some point as I got older, and I stayed very much a practicing Catholic, until 1987 when I walked into this building and um, was ready for a, a shift, a change of something. But even long before that, practicing Catholicism, I didn't really, I mean, I didn't agree with everything. And I, I think I, I just decided to opt out and just pray for faith, you know. I just said, well, I just don't have enough faith because I don't believe in that. I don't think that's the way to, to do it. But I said, well, just, you know, if, if this is what you want me to do, God, then, then you know, some, lay some more faith on me. You know, like, like help me get there because I can't get there from here, you know. And I just let it be okay, you know. I just loosened I loosened the garment, or I loosened the collar a little bit, and I just went around, and I figured I was in pretty good, I was in a pretty good place. So I had already given myself permission to know that there were certain things that I didn't really have to observe all the way, um, just because it just, like you said, really didn't make sense. So I gave myself that opportunity. So when I got here, 
there was such resonance already with the freedom that I could feel here that I had given me a, myself a taste of the freedom opening the door, but I hadn't really, um, I hadn't really gotten footing for it, and I certainly wouldn't have gone as far as Unity went with, you know, throwing out the salvation theology. I, I, that was, that was a mind blower, and it was a little scary, you yes. know. What if I'm wrong about that, you know? <laughs> so it's been wonderful to, to walk through that door that Jesus was and is. And I loved, I loved, I want to go back to the bodies, you know, the Dharma body and the physical body that you were talking about with Jesus and with the Buddha, because it also kind of demonstrates their method, you know. Jesus gave his life and taught with his life, you know. Um, he gave every part. And, and our identity with Jesus and our following his way is to recognize the beingness of the Christ within, right? And the Buddha is also waking up to what is already true and that the pathway is mindfulness and practice and bringing, you know, compassion and loving kindness. In other words, starting to be it in the world is to then wake up and see it everywhere, right? And that's part of the mindfulness. So it's like they give you two different ways to get there, you know? I think it's so cool. And they can, and they can coexist. Yes. And we've discovered that on Wednesday night, for sure. There was a point in, in, uh, in, in my wondering about all of this that I, I reconciled that if God is all loving and all knowing, then I can't do this wrong. You know, it's, I can, I, it, I'm, I'm good with God, you know, God's good with me. Now let's learn, you know, and uh, that's, that's sort of my big um, enjoyment about what you were sharing tonight is, is that there's no the way to do this. There are teachers who make it give us open the doors, you know, give us some some footsteps, but really it's a very, very personal journey. And and then the specifics about it, you know, minimize suffering. That's part of the human condition is to suffer. So but we can't not think thoughts. You know, I don't want to suffer and I don't want to I don't want to be lingering on avoidance of suffering. So, you know, if, to say, don't suffer, it's kind of like, ah, that's a waste of energy. So instead, what can I put my attention on that's going to call forth a, a freer, fuller, more joyous way to live? And that's, and so Christ, the Christ light, that, that seems a little more redeeming to me. For tonight, anyway. <laughs> Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.